Good morning. Good morning, choir. It's good to see you all here. How do you sound today? Perfect. <laughs> We're here, they said. How are you all? Advent has started, my friends. Did you, did you notice any, anything different in here? <clears throat> I have been fully indoctrinated on how to put those banners up now. It, uh, changed my, it changed my resume for some, yeah. Well, well, welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. Good to have everybody here uh, this morning. This morning at 1030, we have the children's pageant, and I suspect a lot of people will come for that. And so if you want to stick around to uh, see that, there's no sermon there at the 1030 service, so you'll, I think you'll like it. Um, not that you won't like today. It'll be fine. A lot of different things going on, obviously. Um, take a look at the bulletin. It, it kind of puts the schedule of events out there, and, and you can see what's going to come uh, up over the course of the next couple, three weeks. <clears throat> As you can see, we've got things uh, all lined up here. We have the Advent candles uh, here. Mike, is that true? Would you help me with the Advent candles today? Perfect. When there's a lay liturgist, helping, and they just say, absolutely, whatever you need. I love that. <laughs> love that. There, there's this season called Advent. Most of us, I don't know, as children, as pe people who are closer to, 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 to their childlike years, did you, did, you, did you know anything about Advent? You did? As a child, I knew nothing of Advent. All I knew was Christmas was coming. Christmas, it was all about the presence in Christmas. And so today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about Advent, and, and, and you guys will already know all that, but some of the other folk who are my age might not know, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Does that sound all right? Good. All right, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. Good morning. Please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. We hear the promise of the coming of Jesus into a manger and into our hearts and our homes. May our worship be filled with the anticipation of the peace given to us by the Prince of Peace. Let us prepare the way of the Christ by lifting up the valleys in our lives and making smooth the rough places of others.
I invite us to turn toward each other and pass the peace of Christ this morning. Go find somebody that you don't know and say welcome. All right. One of the traditions is lighting the Advent wreath or the Advent candles. And so Mike is going to help me out with that. And uh, I invite you to go ahead and read along in your bulletin as we go through. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that, we light candles for the four weeks leading to Christmas and then reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. And so we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. I invite you to join with me. Loving God, as we enter this Advent season, we open all the dark places in our lives and memories to the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you that me may walk in the light of Christ. Please join me in the unison prayer. O oh God, may all that we do in this season shine forth with love. Let the love and peace of Christ be seen in our actions toward others, heard in the conversations we have with friends and strangers, and experienced in the unfolding moments of each day. May this season be a season of hope joy, love, and peace. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. It's terrific. As hard as it is to believe for me, we have made it into December. Just a moment ago, it was Thanksgiving, it seemed like. It has come and gone. Right after last week's service, several people stayed and took down all the the Thanksgiving decorations that we had up and, and put it all away to be stored for next year. And then we got out all the Christmas decorations. The Christmas trees were put up, of course, down the hallways and, and, and in the narthex in the chapel. Garland and wreath were hung. Lights were strung. The nativities were set up. Ornaments were hung on the trees in the hallway. Uh, Vanita got out all the children's pageant decorations. We've got those out. And then uh, we hung up garland and bows in the, in the offices, and they put down little mats in front of our doors. This Tuesday, we order poinsettias. We have officially changed over into the season that the church calls Advent. As a child, I knew nothing of Advent. We had a calendar. Sometimes the calendar, which you would open each little window and it would have something in there. Sometimes it would be a story about Jesus. Sometimes it would just be chocolate. I like the chocolate ones. My brother and sister and I would have this growing, palpable sense that Christmas was getting closer, but that was about it. I don't even think we called it an Advent calendar. As a child, I knew almost nothing of Advent. Everything was about Christmas, and I knew Christmas was coming. Advent, oh, yawn. Christmas, yeah! Advent, I figured, was for adults. Christmas is for children. Time goes on, though, and a person has to grow up. They just have to, sometimes, except for rich, of course. <laughs> yes. So when I got into church a little deeper, I found out there was this season called Advent, pre-Christmas, four weeks of it, preparing. Preparing for what, though, is what I wondered. Well, preparing for Christmas, for the big feast, for the presents, the presents and the food and the cousins coming in. And, well, Jesus yet, yes, but presents. It was all about Christmas still. I got into church even a little deeper, went to seminary, I found out it wasn't just pre-Christmas, there was something else to it. I became ordained and they gave me a book of worship. Do I have it? Yeah, here it is. This book of worship, United Methodist Book of Worship, um, it has different services in it, weddings, funerals, uh, what you're supposed to preach on, uh, different kinds of uh, prayers in it, things like that. And there's this whole section called Advent. And, and it says in here that Advent derives from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming. The season proclaims the coming of the Christ, whose birth we prepare to celebrate once again, who comes continually in word and spirit, and whose return in final victory we anticipate etc., etc., etc. It's a page and a half of it. This morning, we are going to look at this season of preparation. We are adults, most of us. Eh, we can do it. We can do it. Maybe we'll not just look at Advent. Maybe we will actually begin to prepare. Would you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts help us to prepare for this season called Advent. Amen. Now, Mike and I uh, are going to read the scripture this morning. Uh, we're going to do it together. Is there room enough in here for us both? I think we can do it. Um, I, I ask you to listen for the similarities in these two pieces of Scripture. You can go ahead and take your Bibles out if you want to and follow along. 
uh, you'll find that Isaiah comes before Micah in the Old Testament, and, and uh, there's, there's a number of books in between Isaiah and Micah, but if you want to read one of them, that's fine, uh, along with it, because you'll, you'll hear some similarities. But uh, Mike, I, I'm going to have you read the Micah text. Is that, that makes sense to me. I, I thought so. And so if you'll just read one line, and okay. then I'll read a line okay. that's like it in Isaiah, and we'll see if you can hear the similarities. Go, you go ahead and go start. First. Okay, this is Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house. And this is Isaiah 2, 1 through 4. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house. Shall be established as the highest of the mountains shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills and shall be raised above the hills people shall stream to it all the nations shall stream to it and many nations shall come and say many peoples shall come and say come let us go up to the mountain of the lord come let us go up to the mountain of the lord to the house of the god of jacob to the house of the god of jacob that he may teach us his ways. That he may teach us his ways. And that we may walk in his paths. And that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples. He shall judge between the nations. And shall arbitrate between strong nations far away and shall arbitrate for many peoples they shall beat their swords into plowshares they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore neither shall they learn war anymore the word of God, for the people of God. God. Amen. Did you hear any similarities? <laughs> Some of you, yeah. They're just about identical. Some scholars say that Micah, the prophet Micah, took the words from the prophet Isaiah. And some say vice versa. I don't know which it was. No one knows which it was, really. All I know is that somebody was doing some pretty heavy-duty plagiarizing, weren't they? There are reasons to copy somebody else's work, but you should at least acknowledge that's where you got it from, in my opinion. It's only polite, I think. It is enough for me to remember that Micah came out of a farming or rural area outside of Jerusalem. And Isaiah was from the city. So imagine, if you will, farm people and city people living different lives. Can you imagine that? Yeah. In the worlds they envisioned, Micah, who was from the rural area, the farming communities, he was all for the city of Jerusalem to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the map. That's where he thought trouble was. Think about, for us, maybe, what would it feel like if Washington, D.C. was wiped off the face of the map? For some of us, good. Yeah. So Micah was all for Jerusalem being wiped off. But Isaiah, Isaiah, on the other hand, being from the city, he felt that the city of Jerusalem would be where the Davidic kingdom would rise again to take over power from the Romans. So he had this special kind of elevated idea of Jerusalem where Micah did not. But this I do know. They both thought it was important to add this piece of text to their books or their writings. This I do know also that those words have become very well known, whether it was Micah or Isaiah who penned them first. The words sound like this, 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's just flat out good stuff. That is a hopeful, peaceful future. Some of you remember, how many of you remember Khan and Ann McClellan? Do any of you remember? Some of you remember Khan and Ann. They, they were associate pastors here in Salt Lake City, and, and they, uh, Ann served here. I don't know if Khan served here or not, but Khan did too. Okay, so they came from a, a, a school of theology called Candler, which is in Atlanta. And it's a, on, the, on the University of Emory, Emory University in Atlanta. And one of their professors' name was Gene Tucker. Gene Tucker is a retired Old Testament professor from Candler School of Theology. And uh, Dr. Tucker sometimes attends a church called Christ United Methodist Church. Have you ever heard of that? In, in Denver. But that's the Christ United Methodist Church in Denver. And I know uh, some of the pastors who have served at Christ United Methodist Church in Denver, and they said whenever retired Dr. Tucker was in the congregation, they would have to be especially on their toes when it came to how they interpreted and talked about Old Testament texts. And so Dr. Tucker wrote the commentary for the book of Isaiah in the New Interpreter's Bible, which came out a few years ago. He did the commentary for the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39, which was part of what I read today. And regarding this vision of nations not learning war anymore, he says this, wishing and even praying will not necessarily make it happen. But it will certainly not come unless we imagine it, unless we believe and articulate the vision that God wills the end of war. I like that. I like the idea that it's never going to happen unless we believe and articulate the vision. Some of you remember Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was the Allied commander in World War II and then became president after the war was done. Those are obviously important titles. But his family felt that his most important legacy was found in a speech called A Chance for Peace. It was given in April of 1953, eight years after the war was over, a month after Joseph Stalin, the Russian dictator, had died, and Eisenhower said in his speech, talking about the amount of money being spent on the military, he said this, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, articulated the vision for a more peaceable future. But in the 65 years since that speech was given, the vision, unfortunately, has not come into fruition. But that doesn't mean that we let go of the vision. The early church had a vision that Christ would return. In fact, in some places, it was a white-hot fever. It was called the parousia, which translated into Latin becomes adventus, which, when anglicized, becomes advent. Those early communities thought that Jesus was going to come in his return riding on a white stallion out of the clouds with a sword wreaking vengeance upon the Roman government. Things would be overturned. Jesus was going to lead them to this incredible victory. But time marched on. Generations came and went. Jesus didn't come back in the clouds. The fever, of course, cooled. The fever cooled, but sometimes it will become warmed up again when the folk who believe that that story of Jesus coming in the clouds is the way that it's going to be. So they'll make predictions, end-of-the-world predictions. Some people will eat that stuff up because for them, I learned this a few years ago, for them, and I always, had, I always made fun of it. 
I always made fun of that end of the world stuff. But I read somewhere along the line that the people who hold on to that vision are living in a world they believe is made up of tears and tragedy. And that changed my mind about it. And so now when I hear about them and I see who's saying it, I think about all the people who believe it because sometimes the people who are saying it, they just want to manipulate people. But the people who believe it, who are hoping for that, those are the people that my heart goes out to because they think that this world is a terrible place and they just want to get to the next world, right? Well, for the, ma the vast, vast majority of us, the story of Jesus coming back in the clouds no longer holds that much sway. That red-hot fever has cooled way down for many of us, including me, and maybe that's okay, because Jesus coming back in the clouds on a, on a white stallion with a sword, that, that doesn't make much sense to so many of us. What? Instead, instead we wait for something else, something other than that, but we're not quite sure what it is. At least I'm not quite sure what it is. But sometimes, sometimes I think we can catch a glimpse of what it might be when Jesus is here amongst us. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I went down to the turkey giveaway at the walk-in Indian Center right across the street from the baseball park. There were about 15 of us from the church, and we joined in with about another 40 or 50 people from different kinds of organizations and we had this shift where we helped volunteers move the turkeys and other food out of the semis up into the Indian walk-in center where people were walking through to get bags of food and a turkey. And I thought to myself, people caring for others, people caring for others, perhaps that is a glimpse of what it might be when Jesus comes Thursday night, this past Thursday night, about 30 of us came to church and we listened to a presentation from a general board of global ministries missionary. His name was Mozart. He lives in the city of Accra, Ghana. Accra, Ghana is a city of six million people. And, and I was talking to Mozart and he told me that he got his undergraduate in agriculture and then he went to India to get his master's degree in animal breeding. And his job for the General Board of Global Missions for the United Methodist Church is to help farmers in Africa implement these practices to improve their farming. And so, how, how many of you have, and not the people who, who went there on Thursday night, but how many of you have heard of the plant Moringa? Go ahead and raise your... Moringa knowers, there's two or three people. Any, anybody over there know of Moringa? I didn't know what Moringa was. I have a bag of it in my office. It looks like I might get um, arrested. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is the leaf of a tree called the Moringa tree. And what they do is, uh, it came from India and it's been brought over to Africa. And they found out that in the leaves of that tree, there are all sorts of nutrients and vitamins. And so they will steep it in tea and drink it, ingest it, and they will put it in um, food and people will eat it and their nutrition gets better. And so they've been giving it to um, babies who have been malnourished or undernourished and to other people. They found that their immunological systems um, get stronger they have found all these different kinds of medicinal aspects out of this, this plant, Moringa. And I thought to myself, people's lives being transformed by the simple um, increase in, in having better nutrition, is that a glimpse of what it means to have Jesus Christ come from the United Methodist Church? Over the course of these next few weeks, we will have an opportunity to give special gifts to various outreach projects. You've done this before for a number of years. 
We call it the Enchanted Tree. I do not know who came up with that name back in 1989, but it is a good one, Enchanted Tree. It's right out there um, outside the narthex. That enchanted, that word means charmed or delighted. And I think about how we might be charmed or delighted as we see the work those mission dollars do to help people. This morning, if you stay for the 1030 service, I hope some of you will do that. We will see the children in the children's pageant. There is, I think, in all children's pageants, this glimpse that we get of the hope of things to come through their enthusiasm and through their innocence. When we watch them, perhaps our hearts will soften a bit for a moment. I think when our hearts soften and, and, and we think about the way that the world can unfold in, in good ways, that's, that's what I think this time of preparation is for to see ourselves and our world in the best light that we possibly can, even in the midst of it all. Isaiah puts it this way, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. I invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The closing hymn is Like a Child. I invite you to stand as you are able. I invite you to join with me in the benediction. May we serve God with courage and conviction. May we be deliberate and steadfast in putting our faith into action. May we remember to celebrate the Spirit's power and may peace and generosity and hopefulness be our way in the world. Amen. <laughs>